I don't know what the Lord will do. Coming over, I usually fast and wait till I feel the anointing of the Spirit. I don't even let none of them come get me till that time. If they knock on the door, I don't even come out. Then I come right to the platform, then I start praying for the sick immediately. Because there's a different anointing when you're speaking on the Word here and when you're under the inspiration. Now, let me explain it one more time so that you'll thoroughly understand. <clears throat> Gifts and callings are without repentance. Do you know that? You can never make yourself something that you're not. See? You're born in this world sovereignly by God with different things to do. You take a man that wants to be a preacher and goes off and gets himself an education, he'll never make a preacher. He might make a lecture. But preachers are born. God calls preachers. That's right. See? And you might try to be a singer and you set up and squeak tenor for four or five hours every day or something like that. You'll never make a singer. Singers are born. That's right. Well, now, in gifts and callings, now, like on this, how many of you here ever dreamed a dream? Let's see your hand. Well, there's a, most of you, certain percent of you never. And that's right. There's some people who doesn't dream dreams. They never had a dream in their life. But uh, they can't help because they don't dream a dream. They just don't dream a dream. Now, what is a dream? Now, let's listen close. It's your subconscious. And here you are. Here's, you're in your first conscience. Here's your second conscience. Now, when this conscience is inactive, this one becomes active. And you dream of things that you did while you were here in the earthly conscience, this conscience. Then when you wake up in this conscience, this one's inactive, and you, dream, you remember things that you dreamed years ago. Is that right? Well, there was some part of you somewhere because it's impressed this conscience so much that you remember what you saw while you was in this conscience. If you understand, say amen. <clears throat> you understand. See? Now, what if I told you, dream me a dream? You say, you can dream a dream, or dream me a dream. Well, you couldn't do it if you had to. Now, God deals in that subconscious. Many times, he promised in the last days that old man would dream dreams, but the young man would see visions. Now, a dream is something like a vision, only if you're in a, you're in a sleep. A vision is not quite that way. But now, this man can't help because that he dreams a dream. Now, if some of you here didn't raise your hands, perhaps you never had dreams. Well, now, that man, his subconscious is way away from him, way back like at the wall there. He never gets back to it. He, he sleeps sound. A man that dreams is not, he is not sound asleep. He's between a, being awake and asleep. And that's when he dreams. Now, if there's an interpreter, a correct interpretation of dreams, God dealt with Joseph in dreams, and he dealt with King Nebuchadnezzar in dreams, but it's not too accurate. But now, this man can't help because he dreams dreams. This man can't help because he doesn't dream dreams. Now, a seer, a vision seer, a prophet, whatever you want to call it, a prophet is a compound word, just like sanctification is a compound word. It means cleaned and set aside for service. And uh, there's many words, and especially in our English words, are compound. But a prophet means to, to give a personal experience under inspiration or foresee something. Now, the, this seer, his subconscious, is not back there, neither is it here. It's right here. Both of them are right together. He can't help that. Now, if your subconscious is back there, there's no need of you trying to ever see a vision. You wasn't made up like that. If your subconscious is here in a dream, if you're a dreamer, it's not a vision. And this man that sees visions can't help it. He was just made up like that. God made this man not to dream dreams, this one to dream dreams, and made this one to see visions. Now, instead of going to sleep, a uh, seer, his one conscience, he doesn't go to sleep like the dream does, 
but he just sits so close to him till he just breaks from one to another. And he sees things just like a dream. Could you imagine being asleep and dreaming, wake up and on a platform asleep and dreaming that this man seen him a hundred years ago or twenty years ago or ten years ago or two hours ago, then wake up on the pl- and here you're talking to him over here, and when you're talking over there, you know your voice is here on a platform before a group of people. Here you are standing here seeing a vision of somebody, and you see them back there 20 years ago up here in the hills of Kentucky take something that was wrong, and you're standing right there watching them do it, speaking like that, and knowing your voice is back here, yet you're up here in the hills of Kentucky 20 years ago. You let that happen once, and you find out just how, when you come out of it, just where you're at, you're just, you're just weaving. And then let it happen again, and the first thing you know, you can't tell whether you're up there in Kentucky or down here or where you're at. But yet, there's something in the human heart that pulls out the love of God for the people. And in all of that, trying, that's a gift, and trying with all of that, with all the heart and strength I have, to magnify Jesus Christ, and if any time that anything is I ever say or do that's unscriptural, you ought to me to come to me about it. That's right. Because here it has to be right here first. This is God's Word. And if everything we do or isn't found right here in God's Word, now it may not be according to your theology, but if it's in God's Word and God has promised it, that's all right. But it must be found in God's Word because that's the infallible truth. Paul said if an angel from heaven would come preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So we know this is the truth. And in that, then in these nights when I just come down to speak, why well, I just, oh, I just, I don't know, I stand up here and holler a little bit, I guess, slobber. I've been eating a lot of new grapes from over in Canaan. It makes me slobber. <laughs> but I get to feel good about it. And I remember when I was first ordained I in a Baptist church when the bishop, or not exactly, a Baptist doesn't have a bishop. That's Bible doctrine. He's a bishop. But we Baptists call it the state overseer, general overseer, or something. See, not a bishop. They got off the line on that. But what I I always refer to it in the Bible way, bishop. That's what the Bible says he is, an overseer is a bishop. And, um, but I remember when I was first ordained, I like to pack the Bible under my arm, have my papers as a minister, you know, and, and I'd go down the street, somebody say, are you a preacher? I'd say, yes, sir. Oh, yes, I'm a preacher. <laughs> I like that real well, so I uh, wanted to be a preacher because I would stand up and I could talk a little bit, and I thought that was just fine. So it reminds me of the time as I told you about popping the, uh, our old horse that when I wanted to put the cuckaburs under the saddle and pull it down, I thought I was a cowboy. I really seen a cowboy ride one day out here in Arizona. I realized then that I wasn't a rider. But when I realized I wasn't a preacher, the guy sitting present now is in a tent meeting over in St. Louis, Robert Darty, sitting here a minister. He had preached till he got so red in the face he couldn't catch his breath, his knees had buckled together, and when he come back up, he'd still be preaching. <laughs> Somebody said, are you a preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> I was sure, so I kind of keep still about being a preacher. But I do love to tell what I know about the Lord and how good he is. Now let's read his word, have a word of prayer, and get down to the sincere part of it. Now just before we do that, let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this nice group of people that you sent out here tonight. Many of them are sick, maybe some unbelievers, uh, some are in sin yet. We don't know them. You know them all. And i just come tonight to present myself to you, Lord, as a living sacrifice. And I pray that you'll use this, thy servant, to pray for the sick to speak the word out of the Bible, or whatever you have need of, grant it tonight. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will do this. And I pray that he'll circumcise my lips, that I'll only speak that which is your divine will. 
And if I should try to say anything different, close my mouth, like you did the lion's mouth with Daniel. And I pray that you'll circumcise every ear and heart here to hear the word and receive it. And may when the service is over, may the sick be well, may the sinners be saved, the backsliders reclaimed, and may the glory of God be upon every person, that when we go from here tonight, we'll go to our cars and around different places rejoicing and happy and weeping because the presence of the Lord is upon us. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of all of our sins, which we know that many, many we have did, and we pray that you forgive us and use us now for whatever you have need in this building tonight. In Jesus Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Now, there's no man can open the Word of God. I can pull back the pages, read off of them, but it takes the Holy Spirit to open the Word of God. John saw him sitting upon a throne. No man was able to take the book to look on. And the Lamb come and took the book out of his hand, sat down on the throne, opened the book, and loosed the seal. So it's the him we're looking for tonight. While giving out is going to speak for a few minutes, I uh, thought of uh, something maybe that would help while we're speaking. These sick people are sitting along here. I don't know hardly what more to do than to first bring you this word, God's word, and then after that has been brought, then God's Spirit come down and confirm that word, signs, wonders, and so forth, telling the people and everything uh, just exactly the way supernatural spirit beings does. Now, if God is good enough, if it was me, if people didn't believe my word, that would be all right. They could take their choice, but not our Heavenly Father. He's so kind that if they don't believe His Word, then He'll set the church different orders and things like that, just doing everything He can to sane every soul that He can get. Isn't that right? And how we ought to love Him, how we ought to appreciate Him and His great power. I want to read from two places. One of them is from Exodus 4, and the other one is Acts 2. In Exodus 4, we read this. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord has not appeared to you, or to thee. The Lord said unto him, What is that in thy hand? And he said, A rod. Now, in Acts 2 and 8, we read, the, I beg your pardon, Acts 1 and 8, we read this. But you shall receive power as the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received him out of their sight. <clears throat> and while they looked steadfast towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. May the Lord add his blessings to his word. <clears throat> if I'd say a subject, I'd want to speak to you tonight. And I'll mother you here in the, in the stretcher, and this dear loving person, mother here, and here, and all around over the building now, uh, what I want to do tonight, by God's help, if he'll let me, is to speak his word to you that will prepare your heart for the healing service. I want you to listen close. Now, preparation. God, before he does anything, he always prepares for it. How could we, as uh, uh, it's spoken in the Bible, if we, before we go over to fight a war, first we have to prepare for that war. If you're going to get married, why, you prepare for that time. You have preparation. And before you come to church, you made preparations. 
the ambulance to bring you or your loved one to bring you or you had to get a certain amount of money ready before you could come. It's preparation. And God is always prepares the people for the event that's just about to happen. And may I stop right here just a minute and say, I believe that the people are in the preparation of the last great destruction this world will ever know. I believe we're at the end. You can speak to people. You could put a, a Billy Graham in every city in the United States. They'd drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes and laugh at you and everything else just the same. They are in the spirit of the last days. And God cannot send destruction before the people are in the spirit for destruction. God never did, never did destroy anything. Man always destroys himself. In the Garden of Eden there were two trees. One was life, one was knowledge. Man left the tree of life to eat off the tree of knowledge, and the first bite he took, he separated himself from God. And every time a man bites off of that tree of knowledge, he destroys himself. He bit off gunpowder, kills his comrades. He bit off automobiles, off the tree of knowledge, kills more people in all the wars. He's bit himself off a hydrogen bomb now. What's he going to do with that? Everything he destroys himself by knowledge. And knowledge only climbs for, so far it falls back. But this tree of life is endless and goes right into glory. So in, don't depend on your knowledge. And don't never try to figure anything out that God said. If you could figure it out or I could figure it out or any other preacher could figure it out, we will be equal with God. We are not supposed and never will be able to figure it out. Because when we can figure it out, it's not faith anymore. We've got to accept it by faith. Is that right? God said so. I don't know how. I can't tell you how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it because he said so. That's the faith. God is going to do it because he promised to do it. He's God and he can't break his promise. How it is? And some of God's preparations has been so ridiculous to the people who depend on the tree of knowledge. God's preparation has been absolutely ridiculous to the natural mind. Because the natural mind can't conceive the things that are of God because they are foolishness to him. And he just thinks it's horrible to think, well, God would do... A few minutes ago, I seen some woman when I was coming in. Everybody was praying at one time. And I seen a man shake his head and say, I said, all right, that's Scripture. It's a whole lot better than one of these old, cold, formal, moth-eaten something or other standing around. I said, taking the Bible, they played, prayed with one accord until the building was shut where they were assembled together. I said, they got out on the street and staggered like a bunch of drunk men to even they said they was drunk. And now listen, friends, and to you women, the blessed Virgin Mary was with that bunch of drunk people on the Spirit. And if God wouldn't let the Mother of God come into the heaven without receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and acting like that, do you think you'll get there anything short of that? Now let's lay it down flat. Don't try to say Virgin Mary wasn't up there. She was. And she acted just like the rest of them. And don't you think because your name's on a book and you can drive an automobile and, and run around with a nice hat on and a lot of clothes and dress your children nice, that that means they're wrong to the church that you're going in. You're going to get the same thing or you're out. That's right. Now I don't know nobody. Now I only know Jesus Christ. And I'm responsible and have to answer the day of judgment for what I speak and say. Now, God in the beginning, when Adam and Eve, man has always tried to prepare himself. Oh, yes, sir. He tried to prepare himself. When he first sinned in the beginning, the first thing you know, he went out and prepared himself an apron, fig leaf, wrapped it around him. He's making himself. Now, the word religion means covering. 
And Adam and Eve made themselves a religion, a covering. But when God called them and they had to stand face to face with God, they realized that their man-made religion wasn't no good. And if you're anything short of the Holy Spirit and death strikes your body, you'll find out that man-made religion won't stand in the time of death. Oh, don't tell me. I've stood by the hospitals and seen the doctors shoot hypos in their arms when they were deacons and everything else. Right. You're free to say, call to their pastor, you deceiver of man. Why don't you tell me the truth? <laughs> It'll tell when you get down at the end of the road. So the best thing to do is make preparations for it right now. Get the thing straightened up. Get right with God. Now, I notice that Eve wrapped herself up in some fig leaves and Adam, but when it comes time for to face God, they were condemned. They realized that that man-made religion wouldn't work. So when God called them, now how true it is today, when God was, had prepared himself to speak to Adam. And Adam, in a man-made way, was trying to prepare himself to speak to God. But God had to prepare Adam to speak to him. So in order to do that, they began to pass the buck one to the other in his old street expression. And then what happened? God went out and got some skin and made him apron. I want to give you who I think God is just in a minute. Let's take, take a little mental trip tonight, you and I. And let's go back before the, there even was a star in the heavens. Before there even was anything, setting way back in eternity, that was God. And then going out of God, or God unfolding himself, comes the Logos, which was the Son of God, or the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Logos. Now watch, we're seeing God unfold himself. Then he said, in Genesis, let us make man in our own image. What kind of a man was he? He had to be a spirit man. And then he put him in five senses to contact his earthly home. He might have given him a foot like a bear and a hand like a monkey. I don't know what he did. But anyhow, them five senses wasn't to contact his maker. He knew his maker by faith. His soul was what contacted that. But his body here couldn't contact because it's just the senses. That he wasn't, these things were given for earthly uses. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. As I proved to you the other night, it's seeing and hearing and so forth wasn't believing. Far from it. But notice. Now, in this earthly home, they had sinned. And when God came down and he said, Because you listen to your wife in the sit of God, I took you from the dust, thus you shall return in woman, because you listen to the serpent, said to your husband, Why, you'll, uh, you'll brought, took life out of the world, and you'll bring life in the world, and multiply your sorrows, and so forth, and the serpent, thus shall be your meat. And I can see Adam standing there then in Eve. I think Eve, not like some of these artists, painter, a horrible-looking brute. She is the most beautiful woman the world ever knew, or ever was in the world. And if I had time to go into it, I can prove that by the Scripture. She was lovely. When Adam woke up that morning and seen there that beautiful woman, flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, he took her by the arm and walked down to the east. What a beautiful home. No sickness, no sorrow, no nothing. To live together forever. And friends, Christians, that seems maybe to some of you like a Santa Claus dream. But it's wrong. That's the truth. We're returning back to that. Right. I believe it more. I believe I'm in Owensboro now in this auditorium. Because there's something inside of me believes it when this won't let nothing else happen. I don't go by this. It's by this. And this believes the Word of God. This reasons. This doesn't. This just believes it. And then in, when I see Adam as it was, standing there in Eve, the beautiful statue of her, and while she's standing there, these old bloody sheepskins, the blood running down her legs, Adam and his great fine statue of a man, the blood off these sheepskins running down him, 
and God standing there pronouncing death, sorrow, and heartache, and destruction. What? Then I can see Eve put her lovely head over on Adam's shoulder and him put his arms around it. They started weeping, turned around and started walking out of his presence. God, depart from me. You sin. There's your judgment. Then when I can hear going down along that path through the Garden of Eden, something like this. What is it? Bloody sheepskin. Slapping on Adam's leg as he went down. Then I can see all that great spaceless eternity come funneling down like a funnel. So four little letters, L-O-V-E. He loved his children so much till he couldn't turn them away. Then I hear him say, stop, I'll put enmity between thy seed and the serpent's seed, promising a redeemer. God making preparation to redeem. Let's stop here in our sermon just a minute. Let's go back 4,000 years from then. I hear a howling mob in Jerusalem screaming that people are going on. We're setting up now, looking down through a window. I hear something dragging on the street. It's an old rugged cross dragging out the bloody footprints of the barrier. Who is that going there? Why, it's that Nazarene down here, that fanatic divine healer. What's all them little red spots on his back? Look at him, all over his seamless robe, his little red spots. And as we watch him going up towards the capital punishment grounds, they begin to get bigger, 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 directly all run into one. One big solid mass of blood. Then I hear something. What is it? God's prepared lamb from the foundation of the world going under to die for sinners like you and me. God making ready a preparation that would cleanse the heart of sinful man and redeem him back to himself. God preparing. Getting ready. No other way could be done. How ridiculous this way seems. Somebody say, well, why don't you just, uh, why didn't God just say a certain thing? Why didn't he just put the leaves around? See, man can never understand God. You just got to believe what God says. How could I explain to my little girl if she wanted my straight razor to, to rake around over her face? How could I make her understand what it would do to her? She's just two years old. She's got to believe me. That's all. I just say you can't have it. What if my little girl is three years old or two years old, had my shotgun with a hammer's back and two shells in it, she wanted to play with it, screaming and holding on to it. Don't make any difference how much she wants it, I can't let her have it. I know better, she doesn't. I can't make her understand it. She just got to believe me, is that right? And how can God make that woman laying there and this one here, different ones perfectly well, when the doctors have said they can't get well? I can't understand it, I just believe it. God said so. That settles it. How do you take a sinner like me and like you and make a Christian out of us? I can't understand it. That's the greatest miracle God ever performed. It's when he took a, a, a sinner and made a Christian out of it. And if you can, if you can, look here, you believe that God can save anybody from sin because you've been taught that. Well, that's a far more of a miracle. That man that was dead in trespasses and sin. That man is dead, and he had to believe or remain dead. And then after you're born again, you become a son of God, how much more ought you to believe for oh, that's a miracle, for divine healing? If a live man ought to believe more than a dead man, <laughs> see what I mean? You've got to believe it. Can't explain it? Believe it. That's all you have to do. What? When God then making a preparation... The people say, well, now, Brother Branham, when I believe, that settles it. No, it doesn't. There has to be a transaction of God there in a confirmation of your faith, giving you a new birth. How many of you tell people in your, I'm just so sick and tired of seeing people thumbing their way to heaven. They just say, you believe that? Uh-huh, you believe that. You believe that? That's hitchhiker. Sir! God ain't got such things as that. A man's got to be born of the Spirit of God and regenerated and made a new creature or he's lost. That's all. 
That's exactly right. We've got to believe it. We've got to accept it. You say, well, if I believe, that settles it. No, it doesn't. I told you the other night that Cain was a believer. And I'll give you a little stronger meat than that tonight if you want to believe it. The devil is a believer. The Bible says he is. He believes and trembles. The devil is a believer. Now, if belief and faith in God is all you have to have to be saved, then the devil saved according to the Word of God. That's right. But brother has got to take the Holy Spirit, a new birth, a regeneration, a new creature in Christ Jesus. When God comes down, he puts his spirit into you, and you're no more your own, but you're God. Oh, I begin to feel religious already. Notice. Well, I think of God's great program, and to think that we poor, alienated, ungodly, undone sinners have the privilege of coming to his place and accepting him and becoming his sons and daughters. Why am I? And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we'll have a body like his, for we shall see him as he is. Won't that be wonderful? Eating, drinking, just like he did. Now, God in his preparation, back when God was going to destroy the world, before he destroyed the world, he sent for the preparation for the saving of the people that desired to be saved. He always does it. He shows mercy before judgment. And if man spurned mercy, there's only one thing left, and that is judgment. And God don't judge you, you judge yourself. That's true. As long as you're under this spray of blood that's around the world, you have a, a right for mercy. God, the blood of Christ keeps the God from killing you, or he'd kill you just as soon as you sin. But that's still re holding, the blood, holding God from you, from your death. But when you're a free moral agent now, but when you die and your spirit soars beyond that, then you're already judged. You don't have to wait for judgment. You're judged already. God's done said, the day you eat there, that day you die. And that settles it. Then when God sent forth Noah to preach, wasn't it strange? Never had rained. No waters only but beneath the earth. And an old man's come out there, an old holy roller, with a beard hanging down like this, and got him a hammer and began to build an ark, a boat. Could you imagine the people down in the city talking about it? Why, they say, hey, what do you think about that rain story that old guy's telling up there? But he had the will of God, and he knowed where he was. And no matter what the world, how ridiculous it seemed to the world, God had a man he could put his hand on, and he built the ark. The people laughed at him. That didn't stop him. He just built right ahead. <laughs> And any man that really knows the divine will of God's born again, they can call you holy roller, fanatic, whatever they want to, you'll build right ahead on the ark. It doesn't make a bit of difference. That's right. You get ready for it. Now I can see the time Noah said it's going to come a storm, the ranger. Oh, how's he going to do it? I don't know. Well, I never did do it. And they were much better scientists than we have today. Go down in Egypt and look at the pyramid sitting in the middle of the earth. No matter where the sun is, there is never, geographically, it's in the center of the earth. There's never a shadow around it, no matter where the sun is. How do you do that? And these boulders, it's at least two city blocks high that weigh a billion tons. How do you get them up there? Produce something now to lift them up there. They can't do it. They can't make mummies today as they did in them days uh, with the body. They can't embalm like they did. None of those things. They were smarter, really, than they are today. And you know they laughed at that man that stood up there building the ark and saying it was going to rain, but it rained anyhow. I can just imagine. Let's look at this a moment. God had prepared. Noah was preaching. And the first thing you know, why, one day there come a thunder. I hear some of them said, oh, blast went off somewhere. But a, a cloud began to rise. Now I can see the great big Pauly parrot sitting out there. Look over to the mother Pauly parrot and say, Mother, that's what Noah said. <laughs> I can see the little monkey drop the coconut and say, Come on, Mammy, we're headed for the ark. <laughs> the old camel eat and say, Come on, let's go. Two by two they went into the ark, led by the Holy Spirit. 
It goes to show that man hasn't got the gumption of a wild animal sometimes. That's right. Those wild animals heard the sound and took the warning of God by the Holy Spirit and went to safety. And today, man hears the sound of the coming of the Son of God and rejects and refuses to hear it. Amen. You know that's the truth? But God preparing. Seem ridiculous. I can hear some of them say, well, if it does rain, I'll get on me a big poplar log and ride. But the big poplar log sunk. And so will every poplar log sink. When Jesus Christ returns, everything that's not in the body of Christ will be left here. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus never asked this. Will I find righteousness? Will I find people that's living good? Goodness and righteousness is what God, God, Jesus said. Will I find faith when I return? Will I find somebody who say, I got faith. Well, faith without works is dead. Will I find somebody who will stand at my word and say, Every word of it, God. I'm not scared whether this one says so or that says so or nothing. I believe it, God, and I'm accepted in the standing right there on it. That's the thing. God is preparing a church today to be saved just as he did in the days of Noah that ark. And the body of Christ today is that ark. Well, you say, we all believe that. If I ask you how did I get across the Ohio River here, you say, by the bridge. That's right. Everybody says, by faith are you saved. Christ is the way. That's right, Christ is the way, but how do you get to Christ? Now, there's his body. The Bible said, not by one letter, not by one confession, not by one profession, but by one spirit. Are we all baptized into one body, into the body of Christ, which has already been judged, and we are free from judgment, and just as sure as God raised his body from the grave, the church will go up just as he did. All that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. Listen, God making a preparation. How ridiculous it seems sometimes. Take, for instance, Moses. God had a time that he was going to fulfill his word. He promised Abraham that his seed would sojourn in a strange land for a long time, 400 years. But he would bring him out. When the time of the promise drew nigh, God raised up a boy named Moses. He disobeyed God and they had to suffer for 40 years. But one day back down on the backside of the desert, God said, I've heard the groans of my people, seen their cries, and I've come down to deliver them. I like that, don't you? Amen. Well, I want you to notice this. It just tickles me all over. Watch. Here is old Moses, 80 years old, our brother Moses, 80 years old, standing back on the back side of the desert, and he seen a bush on fire one day burning. <laughs> Strange God tears in fire. <laughs> they say this is wildfire. <laughs> well, I admit we got some wildfire, but I'd rather have a little wildfire than no fire at all, wouldn't you? The trouble of it is with you teachers. You're trying to sit back and say, back there on the day of Pentecost, this happened, back there they had this. You're trying to let the people, it's cold, get warm by a painted fire. You can't warm by a picture. What they had, fine, but what you got now, that's it. You can't warm by a painted fire. Talking to theology, what they did back there, what he was there, he is now just the same. Now, Moses herding Jethro's sheep, and he said, I'll turn aside to see what this strange thing is. Now, I never said I'm going to pick some of the leaves off the tree and take it down to the laboratory, examine it, and see if it's mental telepathy, or what's in the leaves, or whatever it is. He just turned aside to find out. And when he did, God spoke to him and said, take off your shoes, Moses. You're on holy ground. And he talked to Moses. And Moses was a murderer, come up out of Egypt from killing an Egyptian. But God said, I'm going down to deliver him and go to send you. Could you imagine? An old man, 
As old as he was, Moses said, I can't go. I, I, I stammer. I, I, I got an impediment of speech. I can't go. He said, Moses, what's that in your hand? He said, a stick. That's all you need. All right. He took that stick and performed miracles. And he took that crooked, dry stick off the desert there and sent Moses down to Egypt to invade the biggest and most powerful mechanized army in the world. How ridiculous. An old man at 80 years old. Could you imagine the next morning Moses sat the poor at the saddle of an old mule, put a young and on each hip, had a big long beard like this, a crooked stick in his hand, pulling a mule. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. <laughs> ah, ridiculous. While wow, the man said, you're crazy. They've got millions of men standing in armor. Don't make any difference. God said I was going to take over. I believe it. That's ridiculous, but God said so. No matter how ridiculous it seems, if God said so, let me get into it. Amen. I believe him. Could you imagine that old man? Come on, donkey, come on. We're going down to take over. And he did. Amen. How's he going to do it? I don't know. God told him to go down and do it, and he did it. That's what it is today. That's the reason I joined up with the Holy Rollers, you, my dear Baptist friend and Methodist. Go take over some of these days. How? I don't know. How could God deal with a bunch of people like that? I can't tell you, but He does it. <laughs> Go take over. Amen. God said so. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and upon my hands made the maid servant. For I pour out of my spirit. I'll show signs in the heaven above and in the earth below. Pillars of fire and vapors of smoke. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Is that right? How's he going to do it? I don't know. But we're going to take over. <laughs> there will be a millennium set in there. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is coming. He's coming out of there to despise that rejected church. By the world. But the one who's not been ashamed, be ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before the power of the holy angels. Going to take over. Ridiculous. That old man pulling a mule with his wife and his kids. A one man invasion. <laughs> but he did it. And he didn't have any gun, he didn't have any slingshot. He didn't have any sword, and his spirit couldn't use them if he had them. But what he had, he used. Hallelujah! You may not be eloquent, you may not be a preacher, you may not be a singer, but what you got, use it! Hallelujah! You can testify, you can do something. Take over! Hallelujah! Listen, don't let that scare you. Hallelujah means praise our God. Listen, I was going into a football stadium here not long ago where I was preaching. Now I looked at a little sign that's always attracted me. It's hanging up over the stadium. It says it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. <laughs> that's right. You may be a little in number, you may be a few, you may be all this, that, and the other, but it's the size of the fight that's in the dog that does it. Right. Here not long ago, I was in the West, heard of an Indian got converted. Said, how are you feeling, Chief? After a few days, he said, well, pretty good and pretty bad. Said, what do you mean, pretty good? Said, well, since I got saved, said, these two dogs in me. Said, one's black and one's white. They just fight all the time. Said, the black dog wants me to do bad, and the good dog wants me to do good. Or the white dog wants me to do good. Said, which one wins, Chief? Said, depends on which one she feeds the most. <laughs> That's it. The thing that's in your heart now telling you that is God's truth. That the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the way and God's preparation today is the Holy Spirit, the blood-borne church, regenerated.
filled with the Holy Ghost, signs and wonders of vindicating it, proving that He's with it. That thing is telling you that He's got a few minutes and you'll be numbered with them. That's right. Amen. Moses is going to take over. How ridiculous. But he did it. Why? God said so. That was the difference. God said so. Now watch that in your hand tonight. Well, you say, Brother Brown, I hardly got enough faith to get out here. One time as a little boy came to Jesus. The whole 5,000 people there was hungry. The little boy had five biscuits and two or three fishes. Wasn't very much in his hands. But when it once got into Jesus' hands, it fed thousands. See? While it was in his hands, it was just a few biscuits. Could hardly feed himself. But in the hands of Christ, it fed thousands. That little faith that you've got tonight, just enough to get you out to the church. Turn it loose. Put it in his hands. Say, Lord, I don't care if they call me that holy roller, backwash, whatever they want to. I'm accepting the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. God, kindle a fire in my heart. Let me come for it. Watch what it will be by in an hour from now. You'll be going down the street singing, I got the old time religion, brother. I'm telling you, the whole country around here knows something happened in the school auditorium tonight. Amen. You don't have to wait for the Holy Ghost to come. It's been here 2,000 years. While Peter yet to make these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, at least. The waiting was just for the day of Pentecost to come. <laughs> oh, my. I wish I was twice my size. Maybe I could feel twice as good. Look! But I'm sure feeling good at my size. Notice how ridiculous God's ways is sometimes a man, how he does things. Now we're going to take, for instance, there was a fellow by the name of Samson. God was dealing with him. Now a lot of people try to think, I've seen this psychologist paint the picture of Samson with, with, with shoulders look like barn doors. Why, it wouldn't be no mystery to me to see that man kill a lion. With shoulders of wise and here over that bargain there. Well, certainly he'd kill a lion. How he could pick up a city gate and walk away? Well, sure, that's easy. But there's a mystery about Samson. If you want to know my estimation, honey, he is a little bitty curly headed shrimp. Five, seven little locks hanging down around his face, little mommy's boy coming down the street, a little sissy. When they seen a man like that kill a lion, that's what scared him. But when you seen this fellow come down there, and the, why, he was just as helpless as he could be until the Spirit of the Lord come on him. And when the Spirit of the Lord come on him, my well, little shoulders straightened out and he grabbed the line and slew it. When the Spirit of the Lord come on him. One day he was God's provided way to deliver, Sam, uh, deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. And right while he was cornered one day with... Uh, a great host of Philistines, a thousand Philistines is up on him, and he didn't have nothing. What did he have? If he had a spear, he couldn't fight with it. So he looked around, and there was a jawbone of a mule. And the first thing you know, the Spirit of God come up on him, and he grabbed that jawbone of a mule and threw a thousand Philistines. Hallelujah! There's more than a jawbone of a mule laying next to you tonight. <laughs> That's right. Let's get up and do something about it. Let's forsake these old cocks and stretches and wheelchairs and crutches and say it belongs to the devil. I have no more to do with it. Right. I claim Jesus Christ's words right. Live or die. I'm with it. That's right. Throw the line with him. Claim your God-given privileges and the devil hasn't got any privilege. He hasn't got one legal power over any believer. He was stripped and robbed the Calvary. Jesus Christ robbed him of everything he had. And give every believer a checkbook with his name signed at the bottom. Whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. Your personal property. Dare you to sign your name to any check there or fill it out, Lord, I need healing in the name of Jesus Christ and use that name of Jesus and stand by it. Hallelujah. The whole bank of heaven will declare it righteousness. Right. Sure. Oh, but Brother Bannon, we got such great hospitals. What have they done for you? The hospitals are all right. Doctors are all right, but what about you? God gave you as a believer the checkbook. Sign it. Now, that was during the time of the judges. 
a little old fellow named Shangard. He wasn't even a judge. Just a little old, very much said about him, a little bitty spot in the Bible, about a couple of verses, Shamgar, maybe he may even ever read of him. He was just a little old Israelite, and during the day, every man done his own way, he felt by doing they had no cooperation. One was a Methodist, the other in the Baptist, the other in the Presbyterian, the other in the oneness, the other in the twoness, the other in the threeness, and the, oh my. No cooperation. They couldn't get together. So every man done what he thought was good in his own sight. That's the reason the Philistines come in and got them. Now, if you born again Christians will forget your differences and come together as Christians, all too we can do something. Our King will come to us, Jesus Christ. But there, a little old sham guard, there's no king. Who is he? He's just a lay member. Well, they build up the crops and work hard. Israel would, and the first thing you know, about time their crops got ripe, right, they got all their wheat harvest and everything, around come the Philistines, take everything they had and go back. That's the way the devil does it. Just about time you get your church fixed to a place and you say, well now, I'm just getting along fine. We're having, we're having a real old time revival. The devil will slip in some old critic and say, you know, man, people just about crazy. All that stuff, there's no such a thing. Just because Dr. So-and-so said, there was no such a thing as that. A man right here in the same neighborhood said, Well, now, we believe in divine healing, of course, if the man's the coming. But after the meeting's over, let me see somebody that was healed. There won't be one. That guy was a lion. He don't believe in divine healing. No, sir. He not believe in divine healing. Brother, it's so whether you say it or not. God said so. If I prayed for 10,000 people tonight, and 10,000 of them died in the morning, tomorrow night, with the same faith, I'd be preaching divine healing. If I preached to a thousand people tonight, they all died, 50 years from now, they're resurrected, and come to me saying, Brother Branham, don't believe in him, you're dying now, but you, you do something else, there's no such a thing as Christ, there's no such a thing as that, I'd still take my choice as Christ and let me die believing him. Right. No matter what people say, it's what God has said. Right, God has said so. I believe God. This little old sham guard, he got his place filled up, and he got his food all laid up, his wheat, and all the year before the fish, he's tucking away from him. I can see his poor little old wife out there, and the sleeves all out of her dress, and his little children standing on a real peak, and her face all drawn down about like some of these little churches now. It's been kicked and beat around. But some of these theological cemetery embalmers, that's right. You know, that puts me in mind of a morgue. They take a dead man in that's already dead and shoot a lot of fluid into him to be sure he stays dead. That's the way they do. Just keep him dead. Don't believe that stuff. Don't go around one of them meetings with nothing but a bunch of fanatics. All oh, mercy. How can you do Then, I can see... This great big band of wheat, you say, well, now, honey, I hear Shamgar saying, now, sweetheart, maybe we, the children now, we got the harvest in, and maybe we can feed them a little bit. We're going to have a revival pretty soon, and, and maybe some of these people have a little, you know, how the pastor gets his church set up to the place. And the first thing you know, Shamgar was standing there talking to his wife, and she looked so pale, and I can see the tears on his cheeks. Poor little thing, she's starved to death. See these little children, how hungry they look, no clothes on, twist these big old fat potato bugs come right in and take it right out just as fast as you can make it. And that, that's the way the devil will do it. Stop it right away from you, take everything you can get. Come right around and rob you of every bit of experience you've got, take everything away from you, tell you there's no such a thing, point to some old crow bait laying on the bank. You know that's the truth. I hope you're reading between lines. If you don't, I'll tell you right off on the line. Notice. All right, but that, that's true. Now, and there he was there with his wheat and everything, and about that time he heard something coming. Here come the Philistines coming up the road, 600 of them. Oh, my. Well, there we go. Here it is again, labor all year. Here comes the Philistines to take everything I got. His old wife began to cry, and the little children holding one another. Shamgard pulled back the wind and looked out. There there were 600 of them, all armed, trained, theological, uh, blessings, anyhow. 
Here they're coming up the road. Armors are gleaming over and the spears in their hands, walking right along. They know how to do it, brother. I'm telling you, they were warriors. The little Shamgar stood there and thought, well, I ain't no soldier. I don't know how to fight. I don't know about it. But to you, holy people, his righteous indignation got up. <laughs> I hope yours does too tonight. Get up against evil. Get up against that old wheelchair. Get up against them crutches. What the devil stuck them on you? You don't have to have them. No, sir. They don't belong to you. Christ said, should not the daughter be loosed on the Sabbath? They've been bound by the devil all these years. But it's going to be up to you. Shamgar stood down and he looked around. He wasn't a warrior. He didn't have time to go away and train now how to do and to fight these men with the swords and things. He didn't have time to do it. You don't have time to go study out all these things and take a... That's the trouble of it is when a preacher begins to learn how to... begins to have a calling to the ministry, they'll take him away to a seminary and keep him there about 20 years and take all out of him God ever put in him. That's right. Then bring him back and he just knows so much mind that nobody can tell it. That's, that's the way it goes. And when he comes back out, he's worse than he was when he went in. If God called you by grace and by power, stay with it. Right. What's in mind of a little woman here not long ago? She was going to a church and she washed over a board and everything. She wanted her boy to go away and be a preacher. He had a little calling in his heart. So she sent him away to one of these big classical schools. And the first thing you know, while he was away three or four years, his little mammy got sick. They sent him word, thought she's going to die. He has to come home. Well, during that time, there's a little woman lived down in the mission of a full gospel. So she went up and said, told this woman, she said, do you believe in divine healing? She said, uh, well, I don't know. Is it in the Bible? said, yes, it's in the Bible. said, our pastor prays for the sick. said, well, can I have you come up and pray for you? said, why, yes, if it's in the Bible. So the pastor come up said, how do you do, lady? said, now, I just like, I don't want to take you from your church. I just want to read you what God said. So he said, here's the departing words of Jesus Christ. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. He that believe in his baptized shall be saved. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink to everything. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. She said, well, it's in the Bible. I said, yes. I said, well, then you're not me and pray for me. They did. The Lord healed her. Well, it went on. After a while, the boy come home, and he was rejoicing. He said, oh, mother. I said, say, by the way, you wrote and told me, was telling me I was going to have to come home all at once that you were so sick with that pneumonia. I said, all at once, you quit, you quit writing. I said, what happened? She said, oh, honey, said the, that full gospel mission down here, them holy rollers, said their pastor come up and anointed me with oil and read out of the Bible in Mark, the 16th chapter, that we should pray for the sick. And he prayed for me, and the Lord healed me. He said, praise the Lord, honey, what do you think about that? He said, mother, said the very idea, you with them people? Why, he said, Mother, down in the seminary, said, them men are illiterate. They don't understand. He said, we know down the seminary that Mark 16 from the ninth chapter on is not even inspired. She said, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! He said, Mother, ridiculous! He said, what do you mean? She said, Honey, you mean Mark 16, what he read to me? For Mark 16, the ninth chapter on is not inspired? So no. The glory said, if God could heal me with uninspired one, what would he do with that really inspired? Yeah. Right. What are you going to do with Mark 11, 24 and all of that? What things you ask in my name, I'll do. Yes, sir. If he could heal me with uninspired one, what would he do with that really inspired then? He could really do things that way. That's right. I see Shamgar now. Well, hurry, he's getting close to the prayer line time. I see Shamgar standing there. He looks down. Oh, my. His righteous indignation begin to come up on him. He got a little fight in him. That's what you got to get, the little fight, little backbone. Take that wishbone out and put a backbone in. That's right. I thank old Buddy Robinson, his testimony. He said, Lord, give me the backbone like a saw log. Give me plenty of knowledge in the gable into my soul and let me fight the devil as long as I got a tooth in my mouth and then gum him till I die. That's right. That's the way to do it, brother. Get some spunk about you. Stand up and claim your God-given privileges. God promised you healing. It's yours. If you're too weak and jellyfish to take it, you'll die. 
You want to stand and say, it's right, then stand. Hallelujah. If God saved my soul, I took it by faith and believed that he did, and God give me the baptism of the Holy Ghost and confirmation of it, if I stand and take him as my healer, when my old brother told me I had a few hours to live, I took him as my healer, and I got the confirmation of it tonight. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Take him at his word and believe it. Little old Shamgar got his righteous indignation up. He looked around and couldn't find nothing. He wasn't a warrior. But what was in his hand? He didn't find nothing but an ox goad. You know what an ox goad is? So the old stick got a big old brass lump on it. They push the dirt off the plow sometime and punch the cattle through the gate with it. That's all he had. But brother, he was sick and tired of the Philistines coming and taking what he had. Oh, my. Aren't you tired, mother? Aren't you, sister? Sick and tired of the devil telling me that I can't walk, I can't do this, I can't do that. God bless your heart. All things are possible to them, at least. That's it. Shamgar said, I'm sick and tired of it. I'm not a warrior. The odds is against me. No matter how much the odds is against you, God for you if you take his word. He said, there's one thing I know. I am circumcised. <laughs> I am a Philistine. I, I mean, I am a Israelite. That is an uncircumcised Philistine. I know that I'm right. I'm a child of God tonight. And I know diseases come from the devil, and I know God promised me victory. Well, I wish you felt like I did right now. <laughs> yes, sir, I feel awfully good. <laughs> but it's my God-given privilege. Yes, sir. I uh, still tonight in America where I can preach it and go at it. Thank the Lord for it. His righteous indignation rose. He grabbed that ox goat and jumped through the window and challenged 600 blisses and stood down and beat their heads in. <laughs> Not a warrior. Not at all. But he was an Israelite. He was circumcised. And if tonight you're circumcised with the Holy Ghost, you don't have to wait till you're trained to be a warrior. God bless your heart, train your God given privilege, and beat your ads in. Amen. Right. So get out of the way, Satan. Kick him out of the way. I'm the guy that's taking over now. I come in Jesus' name. Watch him scatter. Brother, when you use that faith on him, he'll back up. God told me not long ago he had a dream. Said he'd seen a devil, a little bitty old devil standing before him. Said it scared him. And said the devil jumped at him and he'd jump back. And every time he'd jump, the devil, he'd get littler and the devil would get bigger. Said he knew he had to fight him after a while somehow. So he looked around to try to find something. He found the Bible and he'd draw it up and whacky he took him. And every time he would hit him, the devil would get littler and littler and then he'd just beat him to death. That's right. Every time he comes, so just say, Gates yeah, of Miracles, the fact is that is it? No such thing is about him, is it? <laughs> He'll kill you. God bless your heart. Take your stand out there. Say, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, day, brother. Promise me this thing, and I got it. Brother, you seem shrank out on the way. Right. He beat them for his scenes. And look, an untrained farmer peasant with an ox gold in his hand. Be down six hundred armed men. Oh, that's the law. I tell you, I feel like I was just about to have a heart spell to run a little bit. You know what? When I think of that, ain't got quite room up here. I have to have a lot of room to preach, brother. I got, I got to move out a little bit. <laughs> oh my! A farmer with an ox gold slew 600 Philistines with the power of the same God that's on us tonight. He didn't have no promise of that in the Bible either. He didn't have a promise of it. We got a promise. Amen. Oh, let that old sickness drop. One more little expression right quick, please. I'm thinking there's something coming in my mind just now of a time that Israel... Tied back, and got away like the churches that away from God tonight. And the first thing you know, they'll bring the devil always, when he knows he's got the age on him, he gives you a bluff. By the name of Goliath. 
He stood up there, a great big bully, fellow about four times the size of an ordinary man, said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's not fight all these men, kill all these men. You just choose one man out of your group and send over here. If I kill him, you all serve us. Yeah. The big smart brag because he had the odds. He said, and if he kills me, then we'll serve you. Then some of you come over and fight. Ho, 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 ho. What's in the mind of these guys today? Let me see in that revival if one person is healed that I can put my hands on and see before and after. And five years from now, this will be. I believe it. Oh, of course I believe in divine healing. Oh, that's a lie. You know what it is. But as long as you think you got the odds, that's it. I remember when I first started, there's no campaigns in the country, nowhere. I preached on that little subject right there. That big bolster of modern day science stand up with their big wheels are turning and say, Days of miracles is past. Brother, you have to take the corner now. <laughs> That's right. One day, you know what happened? There happened to be a little old sheep herder out there God was preparing. A little old fellow out there just about a four by four foot and a half high, a little old lad like with a little sheep skin coat on. His daddy, Jesse, happened to say, David, Take some wine and some raisins and go up there to the battle front and see your brothers. They're camp. There's none of them going to fight. There ain't no fight in them. <laughs> All the courage is gone. About like you in the church today. Well, I tell you, Brother Bram, I've seen so many failures. I don't know. Oh, my. That makes me believe that much more. <laughs> Son. Now, I don't know what to do. So he got the wine and the stuff, and he goes up there to his brothers. And he met his brothers out on the field. And this big giant run out and roared. He had to roar before the long man one time. <laughs> Little David turned around and said, What's this? What's going on over there? Who is that big scarecrow sitting up there? You mean to tell me that you guys will stand around and let that uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? That's what I think today. You let some of these big theological seminary teachers with all these DVDs behind them stand up and say there's no such a thing as the power of God and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and them days are gone. Not as long as I live. No, sir. Not as long as God can put his hand on a man to prepare him somewhere. He'll not. No, sir. David said, I'll go fight him. And there the pastor, <laughs> big seven foot tall, cowed down his tent. <laughs> Mine. But David said, let me go. Well, they took him up before Saul. Saul said, now, my son, I admire your courage, but I tell you, that man is a warrior from his youth, and you're nothing but a youth. That man knows how to use a sword while his spear's 20 foot long, maybe. Well, he just picked you up and like that. He said, my Lord, he said, your servant, God let him take a, kill a bear with his slingshot. I took a kid out of the lion's mouth. How much more will he deliver that uncircumcised Philistine into my hands? He you knows what he's talking about. He had God behind him. He knows the anointing oil was poured on him. Samuel had done done it. He knows what he was anointed. So nothing was going to bother him. What's the matter? You anointed people. God's done poured the Holy Ghost oil on you. You're anointed. You've got the privilege. Quickly. And look. Why well, said, you can't fight him. He said, well, if you're going to, you put on my armor. <laughs> And the first thing you know, they got this great big jacket of mail, you know, and put on little David. And I can imagine seeing that little bitty fellow stand there with this great big jacket on standing like he couldn't hold it up. <laughs> you come to find out that that ecclesiastical jacket didn't fit a man of God. <laughs> it doesn't yet. When you have to go away and get four years of embalming fluid pumped into you, when God says go, get going. Right. God says you can do it, you can do it. Whosoever will, let him come. That great big ecclesiastical jacket on your theological seminary experience didn't fit David. David said, I haven't proved that thing yet. I don't know nothing about it. But I do know what this is. Brother, I don't know about all your teaching and all your doctrines and all your doxologies and so forth, but I do know what the Holy Ghost is. The very thing that saved me back there will heal me. Hallelujah. God promised it and I believe it. Brother, and he reached out and got a hold of five little rocks and he crossed. And that old guy laughed at him and said, I'll feed you to the birds. 
He said, you meet me as a Philistine in the name of a Philistine with an arm and a spear, but I meet you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. You know where he was standing? He reached out, picked up five little stones, put one in a slingshot, while old guy was covered all over with steel all up and down like that, just one little spot. And here he comes across the meeting, a little bitty fellow about like this and glass about like that, standing there with his spear ready to pick him up and hang him up on a tree somewhere. Here come little David just announcing in the spirit. <laughs> oh, what a holy roll! <laughs> Victory already! Hallelujah! Why do you place the name of the Lord God of Israel before him? All devils in hell can't wait across that. Right. Little David just a dancing in the spirit. Oh, glory! Hallelujah! You say David dancing? Oh, yeah. He was a dancer. One day the ark come in and his wife is sitting up there looking at him. He's a cute little fellow and she was standing. And here come the ark across and David run down there and begin to run and dance and turn on. And his wife said, you embarrassed me. Oh, he said, you don't like that? Here, watch this. And around and around and around and around, around the ark. Dancing. Hallelujah. Right. Yes, sir. said, watch this. And God looked down out of heaven and said, David, you're a man after my own heart. <laughs> you're a dead man after my own heart. Little old David was a dancer. And there he went up there just a dancer in the spirit as hard as he could. Why? By faith he saw the victory. <laughs> Amen. He saw the victory. He put these little old strings in there. One of these stones in, he's going to dance, and here he comes. I'm going to I uh, see drives in. Ha, 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 ha. What was it? He had five stones. F A I T H. In. Five fingers left. This string around. J E S U S. Here he comes. Oh, brother. Look out, drives. You got a ball. And when he set that loose, the Holy Ghost got a hold of that little old stone and picked up the speed about a thousand miles per second, struck that giant between the face and he fell forward. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Like a little Jim Crow danced up there, jumped up on him, pulled his sword out, chopped his head off like that. And I like that, boy. Reached down and got him to the head of the head. But come on, boy. Let's preach divine healing. Wait a minute, Hallelujah. And you know what they done? The rest of them seen it could be done, and they cut the list trees from the wall. Why? Brother, the old critics has got their mouths shut now. Lawrence Nightingale, Congressman Upshaw, King of England, great man. When the divine healing power is true, that night down at Portland, Oregon, that maniac runs in the pet court. God threw the demon right on the ground. Tommy Osborne, Oral Roberts, Tiger, the rest of them, got courage. We've cut them devils from the walls. We've got the victory. Hallelujah! There goes David marching in, pulling old guy's head behind him. Victory! God prepared him a man to take care of it. And brother, about several hundred years after that, the church of God had become cowed down. But I can hear one saying, saying the old I send the promise of the Father up on you. I want this gospel preached in all the world. I want signs to follow the believers. I want the healing sick till I come again. I'm going away, but I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. But before you do this, I've got to prepare you. <laughs> Amen. They climbed up the hillside, up down into the temple, stayed in the upper room, until all of a sudden they got to the place. One said, oh, I don't care if I'm a Methodist. The other said, I don't care if I'm a Baptist. It's sad to see so all the differences got out of them. And when they did, they started blessing God. And about that time, the preparation come from heaven. <laughs> now, the Catholic Church says, you lick out your tongue, take the Holy Eucharist, that does it. Holy Eucharist, a little wafer. The Protestant Church, just as bad. Take hands of the preacher, right hand of fellowship, 
sprinkle a few little drops of water on top of him, take him in, don't prep a little bit. Goodness, how far they're both wrong. But here's what the Bible said the preparation was. Now, another thing. Well, now, my boy, I believe you to become a minister. We will see the doctor and the elder and all of them, and we'll give you the right hand of fellowship. We'll send you off to the seminary, and we'll teach you all about this thing. Never that. No, sir. That wasn't God's preparation. He said, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you do with power from on high. And when the day of Pentecost is fully come, there come a priest up the road with the box and said, here's the Holy No. There come the Protestant preacher said, I'll give you the right hand of fellowship. No. There comes the elders say, we'll send you to the mission field. First we have to take a student. No. But suddenly, that came a sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were setting. Hallelujah. Clove and tongues set up on the night fire. They were filled with the Holy Ghost out into the streets and across the nation. Signs, wonders, they laid in the shadows of their man and were healed. The critics made fun of them. That was God's preparation. God hasn't changed his plan. That was to be until Jesus come back again. It sounds ridiculous to an ordinary man. What a very idea. You mean I have to go down and act like a maniac? <laughs> You'll either do that or stay out here when you want to. That's what you do. Some nobody said, like old name, and he said, I, 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 you mean I have to dip in them old muddy waters? Either do it or keep your leprosy. You don't even want to do it. There was some time ago I was preaching. A certain minister came to me and said, Brother Branham, I couldn't even enjoy your sermon. Said those people hollering, amen, and screaming and hollering and crying. Said, how could you teach your subject? I said, I wasn't trying to. <laughs> said, when do you ever run out? I said, when a cheat gets in a hose. <laughs> yes. When I get a cheek in a hole somewhere, God has straightened out and let the blessings pour again. Said, I tell you, them people just made chills run over my back. I said, they did. I said, that's strange. If you'd ever get to heaven, you'd freeze to death. Because, brother, they're really making some noise up there. Screaming and they're shouting and they're praising God day and night. Overcoming by the blood of the Lamb in their testimony. Hallelujah. It's God's preparation time. God's preparing a people. And if you can't have faith to heal this sick body, how are you going to have faith to raise it up in the last thing? Glory to God. It's this preparation time. Go ahead, you're going to call me a holy Lord, so that's all right, I am. But let me tell you something now, brother. I'm glad I see this vision of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, heals the sickness. I'm glad that I didn't care. I'm glad that I have eternal life. I'm telling you now, when you walk to the altar one day and said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, raise up your hand with sorry praise me, thanking him for your salvation, you couldn't show any physical results. But you went ahead, and you believed it. You stayed with it. You confessed it. You believed it. And now you, everybody knows you got it. <laughs> Do the same thing by healing. Accept him on the same basis. I accept him as my healer. Don't get that little old cow down to him. Well, I don't believe I can move this foot. Why not? You might not be able to walk perfect for a month. But sit that crutch away and walk away anyhow. It's your God-given privilege. Amen. Better I feel good. I just got to quit. I was just getting warm now, so I'll be back to preach for a little while right now. You're getting straightened out now. I'd like to get you over in Revelation to the Lamb coming, but, uh, but I'll do that some other time. God bless you. The time gets away so quick. All you got faith, have you got faith, raise your hands. I got faith, Brother Benham. I believe. You believe it's a preparation time? Don't notice. Don't notice your age. Don't notice the circumstance. Faith knows no age limit or circumstance. Faith knows one thing. God said so. 
That settles it. You believe it? Where's our sister that plays the piano? Let us bow our heads a moment. They're great positions, sister. Something come on my heart, then. Our Heavenly Father, I thank thee tonight because that we're living in the hour of preparation. We're living when you're preparing the people to believe all things. We believe that's the message of the day, the preparation time. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you're calling the people, has given them the Holy Ghost, and now you're trying to call out of that group of sons to adoption. We realize that the old law was that a son was born into the home. He was a son, but the tutor raised him. And then when he was of age, if he had been the right kind of a son, he was taken out, put a purple robe on, a ceremony, and adopted. And that's what you're trying to do to these full gospel people now, to get about to themselves somewhere alone with you in faith and adopt them into the kingdom and give them the right to go forth and to do the things that you did. I pray, God, that you'll take these few examples and share that the great St. Paul said after writing Hebrews 11, said, seeing that we're compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, Father, many are weighted down. They like to run, but they're sick. And, Father, I pray tonight as I have brought them the plain, simple truth of how that you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you commission your disciples to go preach the gospel, said these signs and follow them that believe. Back in the Old Testament, from Genesis on to Revelation, you constantly was a miracle-working God when people were ready to step out and believe you. When Moses prayed and then stepped towards the Red Sea, it opened. When the priest stepped into the water of Jordan, he peeled back from one side to the other. We've got to make a step. We've got to try. We've got to put forth our effort to show you that we're sincere. For it's written in the Bible that faith without work is dead, just as the body without the spirit. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you'll give faith here tonight for these sick people. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask them. With your heads bowed. God put something on my heart just now. He said, you preach like an evangelist, bring the people up and ask them to accept Christ as Savior. Why don't you bring them up and let them accept Christ as healer? How many in here is sick and wants to accept Christ as their healer now? I'm giving you an invitation to walk right up here beside this platform. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sir. That's right. All right. Everyone now. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the truth. Just reverend, as you're standing here, folks, Christian, I will have to answer at the day of the judgment if I've told you wrong. God Almighty will hold me responsible for what I say. You know that. You don't know how I'd like to take each one of you in my arms. Sit down here. Sit there and talk with you a few minutes. See just what your trouble was. To see if I could, if God would tell me what was wrong. Or maybe something in your life that you've done that wasn't just right would hinder your healing. 
Now you confess all your wrongs. Tell God that you'll make it right. Tell him that you'll do it. And confess your wrong. Now you're standing here right now to accept Jesus as your healer. Just as you accepted him as your Savior. I've seen two little girls moving just now. They were healed. I've seen it move over when they come up. Now, I just had to go bless them because he told me to. Now, I want you to come on these bases. Accept me. Now, look, Christian. You love me. I love you. If God who knows, if I, if that's wrong, I don't know my heart. But I believe that I know truly that I love you. And I, I wouldn't stand here as a deceiver. Well, you know I wouldn't do that. And you know God would never bless a deceiver. How has this message just throw the whole world over now? When literally millions of humans, even in the jungles of Africa, after they were converted, I said, don't wait till you get an education. Go right on out. Lay hands on the sick. Why up in the jungles? We've got the healing campaigns going on amongst the natives. Man, who don't even know what's his right and left hand hardly. But they know Jesus Christ. They see him do it, and they believe it, and they pray for their native friends, and they're healed, preaching the gospel, accepting Christ, breaking up their idols, forming big churches and groups, praying all night, fasting for weeks at a time. No education or nothing. They just believe God. Now you do the same. Now look, I don't think you can find fault with what I preach. I don't get it out in the right way, maybe, but I, I give it the best way that I know how. And I know it's the truth. I haven't got the scholarship and education to present it like a man that could do that. But I just have to reach up and grab it and spit it out and reach and grab it. It's the only way I can get it, just as it comes to me. But look, brother, I know it's the truth. I've tested it in death. I've tested it against demons. I've All across the world, this is my third trip around now, and this, I've seen witch doctors and devils and hypnotizers and demons and everything, and, and critics, and everything, come up and say, mental telepathy. If somebody out in the audience is, uh, is looking up here, and I'm reading your mind, mental telepathy, and all such things that's been tried in every fiery furnace, and every time God saves the adversary, drops them right to their feet. There's a man sitting tonight paralyzed in this world because he tried to hypnotize me in New York City. Went to a, one of these army guys who goes and makes people bark like dogs and things with hypnotism. And I said, why the devil put in your heart to do that? And that settled it. He packed him out of paralyzed. He's that way yet tonight. Many other things I could say hundreds, but I've told you the truth. God has confirmed it to be the truth. Now listen to this truth. Each one of you standing here are sincere in heart. I believe that. I don't believe you to come. I believe you in need. And I want that elderly lady laying there too. It's Brother here from New Albany, or she's from New Albany, you're the man that surveyed you two brothers, surveyed my land up there. Is that right? In time? I see your mother sitting out. I know what's the matter with her. I didn't call her last night. I see her sitting there, but I know what was her matter, and you know what I noticed, see. I want her to be well. She was good to me. And you know if anything in the world I could do for that mother, God knows I'd come to it if I had to wade to the river to do it. But the only thing I can say, Mother, have faith. Believe God, accept it, and you'll get well. And you over here, Mother, laying bound up in this stretcher, too. I see some crutches laying along now for Don't pay attention to those things. Let's believe. Now, you're standing here right now accepting Jesus like you did when you come to be a Christian. Is that right? Now, don't look for any physical thing, anything, any results. Just claim it. Now, look. Hebrews 3.1, the Bible says that he is the high priest of our confession. Is that right? Now, profess and confess is the same word there. Now, he can't do one thing for us till we accept it and say that we have accepted it and believe it and testify of it. Is that right? We, he can't do nothing, no matter what. You've got to accept it first by faith and believe it and confess that it's right, and he, before God, makes it right in your state as a high priest. A high priest is making intercessions. Is that right? He's touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now, uh, that's as far as I know to be the truth, and God knows that. And if you here tonight, every one of you, would accept Jesus right now as your healer, and say, Lord, this settles it right here. 
I don't care if I ate twice as bad, if I'm three times as sick, five times as lean, I'm going to, if I can't do no more, wiggle my finger, I'm going to wiggle my finger and give you praise. Claiming you heal me. And as far as I know the scriptures to be true, God's under obligation of your heart's pure and clean to make you well. I've seen it cure psychomous cancer. If anybody likes to have statements to that, I've got medical statements. Right. Cancer. Look at Congressman Upshaw. Sixty-six years in England in a wheelchair. Rolled him into a big place there in California. The Holy Spirit moved and showed him just what was wrong. He told him to rise from his feet and he hadn't been on his feet like that. Guys, crutches and braces and beds and things like that for 66 years. Walked to the platform, touched his feet, turned a handspring, went everywhere. A congressman of the United States. Everywhere. Half say, now bow your heads, everywhere. Now just like you're coming for salvation, you're come for healing. Now everybody in here, you out in the audience is well tonight. You should be happy that God has let you be well. Look at these old mothers and dads and little mothers with their babies in their arms. Poor little children leaning against the altar crying. Gray-headed mothers and fathers standing around your poor old things just slaved a long time in life. Good, sweet, kind. What if that was your mother? What if that was your dad? You'd want somebody to be awful sincere, wouldn't you, when they prayed? Well, they do the same. Now, everybody's sincere. Everybody believes. And I'm going to ask God to heal every one of you. Now, while I'm in prayer, and you feel that God has healed you, I want you to raise your hand and say with a loud voice, I accept my healing or give God praise. And I want you to come now with sincerity. If you're deaf, put your fingers in ears. If you're sick in the stomach, lay your hand on the stomach. If you're wherever you're sick, place your hand. And then or on your child or on your parent, and let's pray. Now, our Heavenly Father, uh, I'm so happy to know that you're here. And many of us years ago, little old bashful boys and girls have now received something that gives us boldness, great courage, courageous as a lion, because the lion of the tribe of Judah has rose in our hearts, given us grace and power. In this building tonight is some maybe 2,000 or better people seated here, and they're under expectation. And I have tried to speak to them upon your preparation, the preparation for our healing, the preparation for salvation, the preparation for victory. And now, you have given them in their hearts faith enough to come to this altar. And I've called them here, and they're here believing that you're going to make them well. They realize that they can't live very long unless you do it. And you're the only one who can do it, and as far as their healing, You've already done it. You did it at Calvary. And you're trying to open their understanding right now, that they might understand that you have did it. And now in this massive group, as we're standing here, gathered, pulled out, confessing our faith, coming to the altar, believing that you have come to heal us, Lord, I pray now, and knowing this, that the only thing that's keeping any person in here from being healed if their heart is right with you, is that shadow of the devil of doubt hanging over them. Doubt. Unbelief. If they only had one speck of faith more, they could be healed, and Satan is shadowing that little thing for them. Now, Lord God, hear my prayer, not knowing what hour I have to come and meet you, or none of us does. And knowing that we have to answer for our ministry before you, I pray thee, Father, to give me favor just now before you, that if I have found grace in your sight, that you'll answer my prayer. And here's these dear people who set your night after night. They're trying to press into the prayer line to search out their souls and so forth. God, may that take place just now. And may their souls be searched out. And now they're sending you wanting to be healed. And your spirit is hovered over here. The very spirit that can make a little old timid person 
stand in the power of the resurrection. And now the devil's hanging over them, trying to keep them from just trying to keep them from believing or accepting their healing. And I ask you, Lord, if I've got grace in your sight to give me power to make him leave from before these people and cast away that devil and long enough that they can get a glimpse down to Calvary to see that old wet coat of blood going up there, dripping smack, smack, smack against the back that was striped for our healing. Oh, God damn it. Now, you devil a doubt that's hanging over the people, come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke you that you leave these people. Come out of them and let them each one be healed, Lord God. I pray that you'll cast away Satan and make the power of God so real to them that they'll look through that shadow yonder and see the Son of God standing yonder with his sight back saying, By my sight, you were healed already. And may they accept it now, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Throw up your hands, every one of you. All that believe now that believe you're healed, raise your hands. Amen. Amen. Give God praise and glory. Look at your audience. Every one of them healed. The power of God. Let's stand to our feet everywhere and give God praise and glory. Hallelujah. Look at your audience. This whole group of people healed. What about the mothers down on the stretcher cases? Stand to your feet. Get up and have let God heal you. God will do it if you raise and believe it. What do you think, brother? The heart trouble gone now? Go to be well? What do you think, sister? The female trouble gone? You're going to be well? What do you think, brother, with your ears? Go to be all right now? God bless you. The little girl has the cross eyes. They're uncrossed. You're all right now. You're well. You can go home. Everyone of you's happy. Let's stand and sing the praises to him. I will praise him. Everyone now. All together, lift up our voices and give God praise. These people, if they are not healed, they are not saved. They've come on the same basis. How many out there believe you're healed? Raise your hands and say, praise the Lord. You're healed. Now, let this audience get the altar. Turn towards them out there in the audience as you accept your healing just like you did your Savior. Let, turn around this way and face the audience with your hands up to let them know that you believe Jesus Christ has now healed you and made you well. All right, I will praise you. I will praise you. All right. All right. All right. Lift that up and sing it loud now. Come on. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the last far sinner. to hear these people say what they were healed of. Raise your hands. Just that just one word. All right. Let them start right down at the end now. Just say what you healed of. Just call it. Say, call that a trouble, stomach trouble, whatever it was. Just say what you was healed of. Let the audience know. Everybody speak what you healed of out there to them. Say what you had. It was healed of. Say to the audience. Lumbago. Sinus. Fritis. Kidney trouble. Arthritis, heart trouble, heart trouble, sinus, man, stomach, kidney. Just listen to that. Let this audience here now, right here, walk right forward and shake your hands. 
Come right down and say, I'm shaking your hand to thank God for your healing. How many like to shake your hand and say, I want to congratulate you for your faith to believe that God can heal you? Come right down. How many of you Christians would like to do that anywhere? Come down and shake your hand and say, God bless you. I'd like you. They just been accepted into the body of Christ. They're healed. They're going home well. Let's say praise the Lord. I wish some of the ministers, look here, this little old mother laying on the cot, raising up down here, being paralyzed, raising up down here out of the cot. Let's say praise the Lord, everybody. Let's just raise our hands and bow our heads and give God praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come here, Brother Bob. Let me be praying to you. God bless you. Keep on praising him. Keep on praising him.